Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Susan Murray, Director of the David Hume Institute. Thank you for joining us on such a sunny afternoon from what I'm sure will be another lively and thought provoking discussion. For those of you joining us for the first time, we are an independent Scottish think tank established in 1985. A link to our website is in the chat if you'd like to find out more about our work. All of our events are free and open to everyone, but as a charity funded by donations, if you'd like to support our work, we've now made it easy, even easier with a new text to donate function and the details are also in the chat. Today, our event brings insights from the Legatum Institute and the University of Glasgow. We're going to discuss the UK Prosperity Index in the context of Professor Duncan McLennan's report, A Scotland at Better Places, which was published in June this year as part of the Action Project. In our last event, we discussed Duncan's research, which laid out thoughts on Scotland as a country of connected people and places. We're a small country with a dispersed population, roughly half the size of London. We have rich nature, landscape and history, but not all places in Scotland are thriving. COVID has fundamentally changed how people connect to the places in which they live, work and play. It's exacerbated the stark inequalities that, so that those with resources have been able to consolidate, while those without, often in insecure employment, with little if any personal reserves, see increased risks and costs. The need to be, rebuild the economy and society in the wake of COVID-19 crisis gives us a unique opportunity to re-examine and perhaps reinvent how we think about Scotland, its people and places. The Legatum Institute's Prosperity Index provides an opportunity to think about Scotland within the context of the wider UK. It is a massive data correlation exercise and we're delighted to be joined today by Daniel Herring from the Legatum Institute to tell us more about the index, its evolution and findings. Now, just before we get started, a few things about how the event will work. We're recording the session and it will be uploaded to the website afterwards. There'll be approximately 15 minutes of panel conversation before we move into the questions from the audience. For the questions, please post them in the Q&A and we'll invite you to unmute so you can ask your question directly of the panel. When asking the questions, please state your name and if applicable, your organisation. If you're unable to unmute, please let us know and I'll ask the question for you. And as we near the end of the event, if we have so many questions that we can't get through them all, we'll group them and try and get through as many as possible. So without further ado, we welcome our speakers, Daniel Herring. Daniel is the Deputy Head of the Centre for UK Prosperity. He previously managed the Legatum Institute's Global Index of Economic Openness and worked in the Centre for Metrics on Global Prosperity. Daniel grew up in New Zealand, where he worked for the New Zealand Treasury on improving investment management practices and government agencies. And Professor Duncan McLennan, he's an applied economist from the University of Glasgow, a renowned global expert in place policy. He has so many letters after his name, it's almost the whole alphabet. And as well as his role at Glasgow, he's involved with several other universities around the world. I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Duncan, and as well as the audience, to what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Now, without further ado, we'll start with Daniel. Can you tell us a little bit about the UK Prosperity Index, please? Thank you, Susan. Uh, so I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Prosperity Index um, uh, and why we do it and why we why we believe in it. So if we can um, start sharing the slides, just a little bit of background about the Institute. So we were started about 13 or 14 years ago with the ambition and intention of understanding what prosperity means in a really uh, broad context around the world and countries around the world. And out of that came a global prosperity index, which now looks at about 170 countries um, across a range of indicators trying to understand prosperity in a holistic way. So looking at economic factors, um, how strong institutions are, but also how outcomes are for, for people on the ground. And so um, if I can go to the next slide, uh, please. The, um, we, we came out with this sort of structure, this sort of theory of prosperity, and we have applied this at a global level. And what we've started doing now as well in the US and now in the UK is applying this, uh, this framework um, to a much more localized level. So in the UK, we, we try and apply this framework to local authorities. So just quickly spend a little bit of time um, talking through how we think about prosperity. So you can see there's various layers to this. Uh, the first layer we call domains. So there are three big um, domains. The first is inclusive societies, which is about 
uh, the institutions that underpin society, both formal and informal. Um, so on the, on the, the top, uh, top left, you can see safety and security, which kind of talks about violent crime, um, property crime, uh, uh, that sort of thing. The next one is personal freedom. The next one is governance, which is which in the UK context is about how uh, institutions um, and people's responsiveness uh, to governance and trust in politicians. Uh, and the final one there is social capital, which is trying to get a, an understanding of how strong people um, trust each other and, and trust um, kind of core institutions and how well they participate in society. Uh, and then you've got the next big chunk is open economies, which are, which are kind of like the classic economic indicators. So on the left, we've got investment environment, which is the availability of capital, business, enterprise conditions, which is uh, more about the regulatory environment and, and how easy it is to start and run a business, uh, infrastructure, and economic quality, which uh, economic quality kind of contains the, the really um, the, a lot of the macroeconomic um, indicators that you would expect at a national level, but but applied down to a, a local level. So things like unemployment, uh, labour force engagement, um, the, the finances of, of local councils and, and that sort of thing. And finally, on the, um, on the far right, we have empowered people, which contains a lot of the social indicators. So there's living conditions, um, which looks at poverty, uh, access to housing, uh, which we term shelter, access to local amenities um, and, and protection from harm. Um, then we've got health, which, which looks at a range of health outcomes and health provision. We've got education, um, which looks at uh, edu the education system from, from very young to, to adults. And finally, natural environment. So, so how well does the natural environment, um, how well is it looked after? Um, how well is it, how is it experienced by people? And so this together it gives us a, a framework, a way of thinking about prosperity, a way of, of structuring it. Um, but then what we want to do is, is begin to, to start to measure it and to, to understand and to find the, the data that, that goes behind this. So um, if I go to the next slide, um, it's just a, a, sim a very simple um, way of thinking about how we construct it. So we, we begin by gathering the data, which um, we, don't, we don't collect or we don't produce any of the data ourselves. And pretty much all of it is, is available through different sources online. So might be the ONS, might be um, different nations, um, uh, government data. Uh, so we, we gather that up um, and we then need to standardize it. So we fill in the gaps, whether there's, there's data missing for different years, we'll, we'll fill that using the um, available data. That's usually quite a simple process of just using, um, using if it's between years, just using the data from a, from a previous year. Um, we also have to, in certain cases, impute data, um, usually using a, a regression function or, or something um, similar. Uh, the next step we do is um, transform and normalize. So um, one of the things sometimes we need to do here is just you know, normalize something or standardize it by population or area. And then we normalize it, which is putting it on a like-for-like -like scale across indicators. Um, so normally what we'll do is turn all data into a score between zero and one so that we can compare different indicators. Uh, and then we weight the indicators um, and we weight, and then we combine the indicators up into elements, pillars, and domains, and then finally the index score. So we basically start from the bottom. Um, the previous slide showed the kind of structure of it. So we start from the bottom and, and build it up. Obviously, um, I can already see some, some questions coming in. There's a, there's a huge amount of, um, of kind of both quantitative and qualitative work that goes into constructing this and a lot of judgment is made along the way. And there are many ways that you could construct an index like this. So um, we have, the way that we, we go about this is we, we've consulted certain experts in their areas about what kind of the best data together is do a huge amount of work internally, testing different weightings, different assumptions, um, and, and we come out with the index. The next slide just is very simple. You can find all this on our website. This is just a, a look at the UK um, overall. You can see um, Scotland up top. Um, a, a lot of this is, um, uh, at a very macro level, a lot of this might be what you expect. So um, the Southeast and London doing really well, and then it, it kind of gets, um, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, 
worst performing as he moved up the country. Uh, I think one thing to note is that what we've, even within that, there's, there's various, once you dig into it, there's various subtleties and differences within the index. Um, you can see patches of, of kind of green on that map everywhere. So they're, they're really, one of the challenges that we have, having produced this, is to, is to dig a lot deeper and actually go beyond the index and, and understand um, what is going on um, within country, uh, within, sorry, within um, local authorities that are performing well or, or local authorities that are performing more poorly and, and think about what they can learn from each other. And the next slide is the final slide, which just zooms in on Scotland across those three domains. So the, the point here is just to say that when you begin to unpack the data, um, you can see a, you can see slightly different, or not even slightly, but, but quite different performance across different domains. And you could keep, um, I don't have time to just keep going deeper and deeper to, to uncover all the differences. But you can see open economies um, performs more poorly than, than other domains uh, there. Um, and I'll be really happy to answer more questions about this. I'm sure Duncan will have a lot to say about uh, the index, but I'll hand over to him now. Um, and, but I'd be more than happy to ask, answer questions later on. So Duncan, if you can unmute and uh, tell us, uh, is it what you expect? How does it fit with the things that, that you know about Scotland and building better places? Um, I think that it's really important to do work on uh, place indicators. Uh, if you're going to uh, do policy with any place dimension, you have to have a clear sense of what the mission is for the place. You have to have a clear notion of the set of instruments you're going to use and you're going to have to track them. Um, I don't uh, want to be that, that tough on Daniel, but he gets one out of three uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we get uh, uh, a set of indicators. I've worked on developing uh, sets of indicators in the past, and it's enormously difficult uh, to get things that everyone will agree. In fact, most sets of indicators get used for a while, then get quietly discarded. I don't think that should happen um, with the Prosperity Index. I would encourage uh, uh, Legatum and uh, Daniel to work on this. It's really important. But actually, think more about the political economy of the places that you're applying it to. Because I think it's a kind of uni-level index, and it looks on uh, Britain from the level of uh, uh, the macro level, as you said. Uh, and I think it's unidirectional. Uh, it, it looks down and it doesn't think enough about how you look back up the recursiveness between national and local. And it also, uh, I think, really doesn't get to grips with uh, the multi-level nature of uh, decision taking, uh, including in, and, and, and when, in a sense, the focus here is municipalities. When I was writing about uh, Scotland of Better Places, I said uh, that we have a long history of bad geography uh, in dealing with these issues. Uh, and this replicates that because the critical issue here isn't actually a municipality. In terms of social change, in terms of trust, in terms of a lot of the issues about community participation, and we think increasingly uh, economic uh, development dimensions, you have to look at the neighborhood and community scale if you're going to look at wider economic systems, it's not the local authority. And in fact, the UK government spent, us, spent quite a bit of time in city deals uh, persuading us it was the city region level. So in a sense, I would, I, I would have a conversation with you anytime about why the municipality is the wrong level to look at the economic and social dimensions. Now, I know you can uh, do other uh, geographies. So, that's not a fundamental criticism, it's something that uh, needs to develop. Where I think uh, one can take issue with uh, lots of, as I said, lots of the indicators or whatever, but given the multicollinearities involved, I don't think that's it, that important, funnily enough. What I think is the sense of whether or not the pattern you produce is chimes with uh, some of the other bigger pictures in Scotland. I, I, the one I have most difficulty with is actually the open economy measure, uh, simply because Scotland is uh, the second most attractive destination for uh, foreign inward investment uh, in Europe. 
let alone within the UK. So that openness, at least to external flows, doesn't seem to have been captured. Also, I think innovation rates in the last three years uh, and, and for formation of new firms just before uh, COVID and after, uh, the UK, Scotland has been high by UK level. So I'm not quite sure um, that we've got the open economy picture. I'd also just as a throwaway point out that actually the Scottish Highlands and Islands uh, have a much greater ratio of G uh, world trade to GDP than most parts of the UK, given the nature of their export. So I don't think that's actually been uh, picked up uh, 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 very effectively. Uh, more, more generally, uh, my difficulty is about, uh, I think that place policy really has to be clear on the autonomies that places have. Uh, and I think uh, my report was about increasing the autonomy, not just of community, but of metropolitan areas. I think that in uh, a, a national context where we have the most centralized uh, form of government and governance control in the UK, I think it's really critical uh, for, in a sense, any index to be more sensitive to the different levels of autonomy. I would also say that about leveling up programs generally. Uh, I know that's not the same thing, but uh, clearly uh, related. Uh, so I, I, I would want to see uh, that recognized. And I think probably better measures of community engagement. The West of Scotland has the highest density of non-profit and community action in the UK. That's not really reflected in any of the indicators. It's partly what you choose. And I think it would be much better to have much more explicit and strong indicator of community action and community investment. But I think you have an impossible job, uh, Daniel, and uh, you'll, you'll not get out of here alive or at least unscathed. Um, and I think that it's been really important. I would really like to see the Legatum Institute think about what this means in a devolved uh, UK with a stronger community involvement. Uh, but I would also, in the Scottish context, think about the importance of linking it to the Scottish national performance uh, framework. I don't see any point in having different suites of indicators. We've already got far too many policy rhetorics running around because in recognizing these new broader things, you can say anything about anything. That's why we need good sets of indicators and uh, clear sets of objectives. So but I would uh, encourage you uh, to work with the structures that government have had. And I think that the national performance framework in Scotland, there was, I wasn't personally involved in the development of it in any way, but I think that uh, it is a really strong, robust uh, level of government uh, action that it would be good if you interfaced with it rather than actually just run a, a parallel uh, uh, exercise. So thank you. Sorry, I didn't, I hope I didn't sound ultra critical. <laughs> oh, Duncan, so much food for thought there. Um, I, Daniel, do you want to come back on any, any of that immediately rather than me coming in with a question to start you off? Because there's yeah, lots, there's, lots of things there's a lot. Yeah. I think I, um, when we talked earlier in the week, I think you, kind of, you, you, you fired some warning shots. So I thought I thought I knew this was this was coming back. I think for me, um, just to kind of give it my perspective on, on these indexes, just as a, a general point at the start, I think you know any any index or any kind of model or any set of indicators is imperfect and it it its purpose is to be useful in, in my in my view, its purpose should be to develop a hypothesis that you can then go and test with further research rather than it kind of provide the answers or provide the, the, exact, um, uh, the exact reflection of a country. And I think this UK index, we're, we're reviewing it at the moment. Um, there will be things that we change in the coming sort of six months as we, as we review it. Um, I think a lot of the things that you've said, I've, I've written down, and I'm going to go over here and think about. Um, I think the first one, the first point that you said was on the the level of um, the level uh, that we examine the, the kind of information that we gather. Uh, first point to note is that there is a, it's a challenge to gather information at the right level and then to and then to present it back at the right level when you have a, a single index. But certainly, um, when you 
when you're thinking about these things, you know, something like crime, for example, we present at a local authority level, but even within a local authority, it's hyper, sometimes it's very localized where crime is happening or, or, um, or uh, another one might be social capital, which you, you describe kind of neighborhood by neighborhood, how do, how do people actually, um, how do people experience their lives? So I think that's, I, I, um, that is a real challenge for us and how do we both capture that information and then present it back in a way where you, we've got a whole lot of indicators that are at slightly different levels. And um, that is something that uh, we are thinking about and, and, want, to, and want to do better. Um, seeing one was on open economies, uh, I, um, I need to have a think about that. I think, you know, when you start to break it down, um, Scotland, you know, the different parts of Scotland do slightly better on that. And there's also, um, there are measures of innovation. If you look at Edinburgh in our index, you look at those measures of innovation, it will do slightly better than, than other areas. So part of the challenge with all of this is providing a, an aggregate picture that, that doesn't quite capture the nuances, or, or that's the problem in this presentation. I encourage everyone to go on our website and, and dive in deeper to, to some of those indicators. Um, I think the third point was on autonomy, and this is something I really absolutely agree with you, Duncan, on about the different levels of power that, that should exist at different levels of government. I, when you, you look at the, the kind of um, all the reports that are coming out about leveling up in the UK at the moment, every, pretty much everyone talks about devolution. And they're often talking about England, actually, but it, I think it just applies across the board that the, the, right, um, the right powers need to go to the right levels. And I, I think in the case for a lot of economic um, policy, a lot of economic power um, needs to go to the, the regional level. Um, so, so not local authorities are almost too small to, to deal with that, or um, council areas or are metropolitan areas are almost too small to deal with that. You really want to be thinking in sort of larger areas and then, and then plan do economic planning around that. Uh, I think that's everything I want to say for now. Um, Susan, if there's anything else you want to um, ask me, I'm really happy to answer. And how, how do you go about choosing when you're weighting the, the data within a section? How do you go about choosing how one thing is more important than another and giving it more weight in the sample to get a score? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We, we do a combination of, we just do a few statistical tests and we we look at you know if there's if there's two indicators that are highly correlated or um for example we might say it's useful to include both of them to see just to see them and to see how they how they look um but you might give them like half weight so that they're, they're not overly skewing the the score um but I, in the end it comes down to, to judgment and what we as an institute think is think is important um, so it's a, a combination of kind of statistical tests and then what we think is important. We take inspiration as well from our, what we've done in the past in our global and US indexes and, and think about, you know, what did we do there? And a lot of our work has been, um, there has been kind of tested and, and seen by the people. So we, we use that as the, the starting basis and then we adjust it to the UK. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did in the action project, which is what a Scotland was of better places was part of, is involve people with really lived experience of the places. How how do you involve people that live in the places that you're measuring and and maybe challenge assumptions that you might have from just judging whether or not one thing is better than data? The reason I'm asking that question is because I noticed that Crawley scores really highly on economy sense, but having been born in Crawley, I know that their economy is so intricately linked to the success or not of Gatwick Airport. It's actually not very broad and not very sustainable because as soon as the airport dips, there's lots of unemployment in the town. Whereas the, when you see the, the data for Scotland on open economies, there, there are much more diverse economies that I would think were more resilient to shocks. And I wonder how things like that are factored in. Yeah, so we have, um, during the construction of the index, we didn't, we, we consulted with a lot of kind of academics. We didn't go out to communities as much and, and consult with them. That's what we've actually been doing since we produced the index. We almost needed to produce something 
and then go out and, and talk to people. And, you know, this is a, 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 I would describe the UK index as a work in progress. We're, we're constantly trying to improve it, think about better ways of doing it. Um, and we have had plenty of feedback like that where, where different people have said, you know, this indicator doesn't, or like this area doesn't actually reflect how I think about this area. And that is sometimes due to just to the data we collect. Um, sometimes it's due to uh, the limitations of um, of the yeah, the limitations of the data or the or the, the way that the UK um, the ONS has constructed it slightly different. So that's that's a bit challenging. I think that the real place where we want to get community feedback is is less in the construction of the index because we are because that's useful but an index is always limited in what it can do because it is by nature quite a broad thing but really in the work coming out of that saying okay this is what the index says but is this correct can you tell us what you think and a lot of the time we've found i've worked on some of our we do this at a global level as well a lot of the time you find that when you take this data and you take it to someone they'll say oh that's kind of true but let me just provide a, a, a twist on that exactly like what you said with crawley which is that's kind of true, but it's because of Gatwick. What you need to think about is X, Y, and Z as you um, as you think about the economic development of this area. Yeah, yeah, and I think that when you when you look at the map of empowered communities and see um, the Highlands as red, that's definitely not my gut feeling of the communities in the Highlands, and it just things like that jump out I think as soon as you've got an experience of a place. So um, I'm going to come to questions rather than hog the floor, and. Um, Chris Carr has off asked a, a really um, good question to start us. Chris, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Are you still with us, Chris? We lost you. No, he's not going to ask it. I'll ask it for him. Um, how do you handle Adam Smith's wealth of the nation type indicators and also the classic split between annual GDPs versus capital accounts? It's a very <laughs> I'm not sure what Adam Smith's classic indicators um, are in this context. Are you just... Uh, and then the second... Sorry, can you say the second part of the question again? Um, the classic split between annual GDPs versus capital accounts. So I think um, what that is, I think what that question is asking is the difference between, you know, like annual economic output versus building up capital. And I'm not sure if he means kind of wider concepts of capital or just, just strict capital. Um, I'll focus on the narrow concept first. I think the you know, we, um, we have various measures of, of sort of GBA, which is gross value added by um, different council areas and, and local authorities. So we, we try and look at, you know, the, how that changes over time, that GBA per person, um, uh, GBA per hour worked. Um, and we also try and use that almost as like a, we use the GBA per person as a comparator for the whole index. So how well does the index sort of correlate with GBA per capita um, as a way of trying to understand. Um, it's almost like an independent variable that we're trying to compare it against. In terms of capital accounts, I think, you know, you can understand, in a very narrow sense, we have a, we do look at um, council areas and local authorities, sort of capital spending and, and debt um, and things. So that's in the index. Uh, in a broader sense, um, I used to work the New Zealand Treasury and they used to always try and think about capital with other country like social and, and natural capital which I think is a really useful way of thinking about things and I, I think in a broader sense that is what the index is trying to capture we just don't do it explicitly but we are trying to think about um, you know the say the human capital of a place um, by looking at education levels we are trying to think about the natural capital of a place by thinking about how it looks after the environment um, but we don't use that structure explicitly in the index but it's quite easily translated i think i hope that i, I wish i could um clarify the question with him i don't i don't know if you want to say anything. could i 
comment, Susan, on yep. the uh, Adam Smith point? Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually it depends on which particular books of Adam Smith you read, uh, what uh, uh, set of indicators you would draw up. He did have the theory of moral sentiments, uh, and maybe that's why we all still love each other in, in, in Scotland, as well as in, uh, uh, the wealth of nations. If the implication that Smith would take you down the road of measuring prosperity in terms of GVA, you certainly would not. Uh, and the wider sets of issues about the distribution of income and the quality of life, that in a sense, governments now are thinking about beyond narrow uh, uh, GVA, which really requires us to have the kind of indicators that Daniel's talking about or the sets of indicators. I think uh, uh, Smith would lead us to quite a broad set of indicators. It would certainly feature distribution, but they would also uh, focus on enterprise uh, and innovation and labour uh, productivity as well. So um, I'm not quite sure what Chris was getting at, but um, I, I think you could even fit Daniel's work into uh, Adam Smith quite easily. Oh, Chris has just raised his hand. Chris, do you want to come back in and and comment on anything? Yeah, OK. Um, so, uh, yeah, can you hear me OK, Susan? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, um, we had, had a debate last week with, uh, with Amartya Sen about this <laughs> at the book festival. Uh, the, the, obviously, Adam Smith is very broad in terms of philosophy. You know, one would accuse him of being narrow, and I agree. Uh, Moral Sentiments is a very broad book. He's very humane. He's, you, know, you can take his quotes about the importance of alleviating poverty, for example. However, in the Wealth of Nations, he is very clear. He is examining the Wealth of Nations. And the difference here is that the mercantilists had a very kind of capital account orientation to wealth. You know, they had this absurd idea that if you maximize gold, your wealth in the capital account, that that somehow would be good for the nation. And in opposition to that, it was quite clear in the wealth of nations to say that, no, it's the income is more important per year. So actually in wealth of nations without being narrow, he does move you towards the income GDP accounts, although he wouldn't use the term, but it's very much an income statement uh, as the key measure for wealth. That's the opposite to say the Doomsday Book, because he was looking at 1066 as well. The Doomsday Book, of course, is the capital accounts. And that becomes more important today because one of the issues for the environmentalists is that, you know, you can get negative effects in terms of our investment in the future and foreign direct investment, our investment so important. So it, there is a clash between we need income statements and we also need the capital account and some uh, recognition of the investment affects positive and negative for the future. And yes, sure, you then at, at some point have to come down to broader issues that are more humane and particular community issues. But I think Adam Smith's framework is quite useful because otherwise it's very piecemeal when you collect bits of data. And it, it's a debate that has gone on for several years and a lot of people have contributed worldwide. I think, Chris, you brought us on really to um, anyone that wants to think about this more. We had Professor Ben Friedman talking earlier in the year um, with Catherine Trebek and yeah. the, the concept of wealth came up and what Adam Smith meant by wealth. And maybe perhaps in recent years, we've used it in a much narrower frame than um, Adam Smith actually meant it. So I think that that brings us in really um, closely to that. And um, as Chris took us away from um, Chris took us to the big picture. And there's a question in the, the text from Emily. Emily, do you want to unmute and say a little bit about your work? Because um, I, I happen to know it's absolutely fascinating and um, I'm not sure if Duncan will be aware of it. So if you could say a little bit about the stuff you do and then ask your question, that would be amazing. Hi, Susan. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Emily Wallace and I work for the Cora Foundation in Scotland. Um, we are currently working on the development of something called Participatory Scotland, um, which is a model of building the social infrastructure that people need to participate locally in ways that are meaningful for them. It's 
in partnership with Participatory City Foundation, who have um, a project called Everyone Every Day Down Embarking in Dagenham. Now, this is really about um, how you can support local action and local activity. Um, and in terms of the indicators and or rather the index and the indicators and how we use them as something that, that can support communities um, or support our places. I wonder how do we ensure that local voices with their aspirations and their ideas have influence over the structural and policy decisions that might affect prosperity rather than having to respond to the decisions after the fact? Thank you, it's a great question. Uh, for me, um, again, I would say the, the index captures those ideas and those indicators. It doesn't answer the question of how, how you ensure that those, um, those things are happening. It just, it just attempts to capture whether those things are happening. Uh, I think for me, and, and we, we are trying to do some, some work on this, but I think for, for us, there is, I think a lot of it comes back to um, Two of the things that, that Duncan and, and I've already talked about, which is, I think, thinking about first of all where the where the right level of um, authority and power lies. So, do our local decisions that should be made locally and affect local people are they made at the at the right level? Um, and and secondly, there's really this big question around because that's kind of an institutional question that there's a really big question about how you rebuild participation as something people want to do um i'm and and not rebuild i don't, I don't i'm not saying it's, it's not there but how do you keep encouraging it and keep keep growing it um and I, I, those two things are um almost need each other i think in, in making this work and they're, they're interdependent duncan i don't know if you want to say anything I do think that um, when we at both uh, kind of metropolitan and community levels, uh, we do need better indicators of community capability in some sense. Uh, Chris Carr referred to a march at Seine. Well, thinking about uh, uh, the position we took in, in better places, Scotland, that uh, place policy is not simply about what government does to places but how it sets up the institutions and sets, sets up uh, nonprofits, firms or whatever in ways that they use the capabilities and creativities that there are locally. I think policy systematically fails to reach that and always has in the 40 years that I've dealt with that with the singular exception, well, not singular, but with the obvious exceptions of the community land transfers in Scotland, which really make the point about knowing the capacity to change, but also the community-based housing association movement in Scotland, which has been really important. Um, so I think that, you know, when you're looking at the potentials for change, if I was uh, advising the Scottish government, uh, which I don't, don't really do these days, uh, I would be saying to them, let's start with knowing where the capabilities are. Don't always see uh, regional spatial urban policy as a redistributive act, but see it as a creative act. And, I, and, and have the indicators that, in a sense, uh, give you uh, scope to work, maybe hope to work uh, in, in that particular way. Now, I know that's a big ask, uh, Daniel, because indicators have traditionally not done that. But if you think of the rhetoric of policy, they need to do that. I mean, it's maybe worth having, oh, I've got an echo. Um, one of the things that there's been a few conversations on in Scotland is indicator species. So instead of collecting a whole suite of massive data, are there certain things that tell you that change is happening and maybe you don't need to capture every single change, but you can capture something that gives an indication that other changes have. So one of the ones that's, that's talked about a bit is um, there's a, a really big link between whether or not you can walk safely about your community and levels of volunteering in that community. And the two, the two go hand in hand. So higher rates of walking give you higher rates of volunteering. And there are a whole range of other things connected to that, but it's, it's quite an interesting dynamic that isn't often considered when people are talking about interventions to, we need to increase volunteering, what do we do? You make a community more walkable. 
There's another one that's coming out from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance of um, uh, the number of girls that cycle to school. Now, Catherine Trebek talks about this quite a lot because in order for that you to, to know if girls are cycling to school, you know, is it safe? Are the roads safe? Um, what's your community crime rate? All those other things. But by tracking one indicator, it gives you a whole suite of signs that other things are going on. And I just wonder, you've got so much data in this, Daniel. I'm just wondering if you're going to have to almost add more in or rein it back and use indicator species. Uh, yeah, I think we, when we're constructing it, we are trying to almost balance those two tensions. So I think there's about, I need to remember, it's about 250 indicators in there at the moment, which is quite a lot actually. And, um, uh, and but in the process of doing that, we almost are trying to say, okay, does this, does this indicator add information, add, tell you something more about an area than, than it otherwise um, than it otherwise would. I think in addition, what we would be, uh, like I said, the index is um, just part of what we do. It's, it's almost the, the starting point for testing hypotheses. And I think what we're always interested in is what local information, what, whether that's kind of data in a narrow sense or, or more broadly, you know, um, uh, sort of other reports written or, or just interviews with people and hearing their stories about what goes on in the ground gives you a more holistic picture. So I think there's a way for, our, for us, the challenge is how do you capture all of that information, um, not just what you can put into an index. Uh, I think the thing about what you said about, um, yeah, the, the, trying to find the indicators that really matter is really important. And it, it's really, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I know we haven't got this 100% right, um, but getting the, Getting the indicators that really tell you what is um, what is driving other things. Um, I think what you said was a, was a great example of, of that, um, and that's what we're always that's what we're always trying to do. Creating the index. Yeah, Duncan, any thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree with you. You can uh, uh, usually pick a, a small number of indicators that tell you a lot of uh, quite big things. Um, I was involved, um, I think about 1990, in constructing a set of indicators for uh, the World Bank uh, uh, about the equality and uh, vitality of cities. Uh, and I think we ended up using 13 indicators because there's about 10 countries involved in the exercise and statistically the multicollinearities plus the limited number of uh, data availabilities across time and space um, uh, uh, matter. Uh, but I think that, you know, when you looked within countries, the indicator you pick was highly correlated with uh, 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 other things. So I think you're right. You don't have to have all the indicators. Uh, I also think there's a point about, um, you know, that uh, you can move towards uh, kind of happiness related indicators. Um, and I think there's quite a number of problems uh, in, in that area in terms of measurement and stability. Uh, and actually in the Canadian exercise I was uh, responsible for playing into the World Bank exercise, um, they based a lot of uh, the vitality of cities on household survey data that collected from 10,000 people in, in Toronto. Um, and it came down that uh, there was enough uh, in the survey in terms of numbers of people that you could do some ethnic breakdowns. Nobody was surprised that the Colombians in uh, Toronto were the happiest and most satisfied people because Colombians always express uh, 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 some happiness or uh, regardless of the survey context. What surprised people was that the Scottish people, and there's a large number of them in Toronto metropolitan area, came out rated the second highest. I was completely confused by that until I realized that the survey had been conducted two weeks after Scotland had beat England 2-1 at soccer. Now I suspect if you went back, I'm not being uh, flippant here, but I suspect if you go back uh, to a different period, you'll get a different score. So I've uh, a, a lot of sympathy uh, for what Daniel's picked. I also, agree with you, Susan, that you can pick a smaller number 
But if the smaller number are going to be happiness based, I think that's more problematic rather than outcome based. Mm -hmm. So we've got a question by um, someone that's not able to unmute um, that's asked about the national performance framework. We, you touched on that slightly, Duncan. If you were advising government now, what would you, how would you advise them to work by you know, the, um, using the Legatum Institute's data analysis to um, continue to develop the NPF? Um, well, I'd start by thinking about in terms of some of the, the um, economic development and community issues about what are the institutions and levels that drive change or possibly drive change in Scotland. And I think we do have to have a neighbourhood or community based uh, set of indicators. I think it's then really important that at the level of regional partnerships or uh, the um, uh, metropolitan areas that we use in the city deals, that is another powerful level, both uh, functionally and uh, institutionally. And then there's a, a Scotland level. I would be saying to them, I think at this level, you have to, A, use the national performance framework uh, for uh, Scotland level activities and the things you do. And sometimes it does get used and sometimes it doesn't, but use it systematically, work to continue to develop it. And no Scottish government has done that but then actually think about what you learn from the, the legatum exercise and how you might actually work together to produce something uh, that was uh, really meaningful uh, at these three scales within in Scotland. I think that would be useful, not just for the Scottish government, but the people who really get left behind because of all the cutbacks and analytical and data capabilities at local authority levels, just when big data comes on where you could actually do some of these uh, framings, um, I think that there is real merit in seeking collaboration to take uh, that for, uh, uh, these things forward. I think I Legatum think is very interesting because it doesn't say we're great, uh, uh, but because it says there's some pro ironing out whether these are real statistical or whatever, I think is a really useful thing to do. I think the, the data zone point that came up in conversation earlier is, is really critical because we've now got capability to analyze data on much smaller scales than we've had previously. So your point about local authorities being too big because the differences within individual local authorities can be really, really stark. It probably brings us on to, there's another question in, in and we've probably just got time for it, about um, how would this connect to local outcome agreements, Duncan? You, that's probably another one for you, if that's all right. Um, well, I think it, 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 it would, but it's about developing uh, that conversation. Uh, with local, out, I think local outcome agreements do need to be uh, revisited to make sure they're somewhat richer. I mean, they're pretty sparse in terms of uh, what they state. Um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, Daniel quite rightly pointed out that you can use indicators in two ways. One is a kind of, can, it was once described as can opening. You, you kind of open up a problem by using the indicators as opposed to metering, you know, and uh, that's my worry about the UK government is they will use this for metering and rewarding in relation to uh, levelling up, which I don't think is a good approach. But I think the local outcome agreements in Scotland, there should be a clear cascading down. Uh, and sometimes the relevant indicators might change it. Getting uh, down from the Scotland level to uh, 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 community uh, based. There certainly was an intention when community planning was first thought about in Scotland in the late 1990s that it wasn't about actually fashioning a conversation between bureaucrats um, uh, uh, of different two levels of government, uh, but it was actually about within uh, particularly large local authorities bringing together informed neighbourhood statements uh, with the need to integrate them into the uh, wider realms of policy. So I, I think that there is real potential to do something very interesting that uh, would lead to better UK, Scottish and local per performance. Daniel, do you want to add anything on that? Sorry. Sorry. Um, you, do you want to add anything on that, Daniel? 
Um, no, I think I'm, I think Dan can. Um, I think I can cover. Okay, that's that's fine. So we're rapidly running out of time. Um, I will just double check. No, we're not standing with any open questions at the moment. If anyone has got any asked questions, please do get them in quick. And um, I am going to shortly hand over to both Daniel and Duncan for final thoughts. Um, and I just need to thank everyone for turning up today on what is a sunny, sunny bank holiday in Scotland and um, historical because of our old connection between the school calendar, I think, and um, the farming community. So um, probably another local context that maybe um, that uh, we hadn't thought about in advance, to be honest, when I was picking the date with Legatum. Uh, so um, there's lots to take away from today, lots to think about to go away in detail. We will definitely think about if there's information we know about that might help thinking about the local context in Scotland. Um, regular attendees will know that we're trying something new today with this text to donate. Um, so if there's anyone that does want to do that or try it or talk to us about it, um, please, please do so. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. So I'll hand over to who wants to go first, Daniel or Duncan for final thoughts. Well, I'd, I'd like, like to uh, thank Daniel and um, uh, give him a Scottish quote, which I think might be appropriate, in, in fact, uh, of uh, Burns. Um, oh, would some power of the gift to gear us to see ourselves as others see us? And uh, your indicators are an important way of us seeing ourselves uh, and these different domains you talk about. We might want to change uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the way you see them uh, somewhat, but the general idea, taking that perspective, I think is extremely helpful. And there ought to be, I think, uh, a proactive and, and kind of tough conversation about this in Scotland, because right now we have four or five really confusing policy narratives that run around, cut across each other, uh, and uh, lead to, I think, uh, a sort of, uh, it's like trying to understand Scottish public policy right now is like treading through mud. Uh, and I think that um, actually having a discussion about indicators and where we're going and would give us some clarity. Not, not controversial there at all, Duncan. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'll try and be less controversial. No, no, I think for us... Controversial is fine. Don't worry. If you want to. <laughs> no, I think for us, we, we do this work. To, to offer up a perspective and, and to offer something that is hopefully useful. Um, and I think just to go to Duncan's point, our, our, one of our convictions is that data, metrics, setting benchmarks is a useful way of, of driving policy, driving change, of um, getting, uh, coalescing decision makers and, and people that make, um, people that are interested in decision around, around a, a, a direction of travel. And um, I think probably the most important thing with any of our work is, is that it, it offers a different perspective and it offers something that is hopefully useful. Um, in just in regards to the last question, one of the questions about the performance framework, I think any of these things, any frameworks, any measures needs to be owned by the people that are being held to account by them. Um, they can't be something that is kind of just taken from somewhere else and, and adopted without any modification. Um, and so really what we what I would say with ours is if, if it is something that is useful to you, um, if it's something that helps you understand UK or Scottish policy, or even if you're interested in some of our global works and some of the global challenges, um, take it and, and adapt it for your, for your purposes. Don't just, don't just take it on, um, on face value. And if there's any suggestions for change, if you know of, data that can help if you're um if you're interested in some of the things we say and you want to engage with it just please contact us we, we love hearing from people we love having having these debates fantastic thank you very much daniel i have learned so much especially duncan's analogy of um metrics to open a can and how was the other one that duncan no, you you use a can opener to open a can susan you can use metric you use <laughs> metrics to dish out the uh, 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 pocket money to the children. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. I, I have learned so much today. Um, you have uh, an enviable task, Daniel, in that it's 
it's such a big project and there's so much data. Um, there's always going to be lots of opinions on, on what's prioritised or not prioritised, but I, I think it's really interesting to see, um, and, and not least because it's, it's something UK-wide, so it does allow different policies to be looked at in different ways. I, I think there's some interesting results for Scotland, and there'll be different opinions in the audience as to, to what they are, but at least we can now see it all, and I do love a colourful map as a geographer. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Thank you ever so much, everyone. And uh, uh, go and enjoy the rest of your sunny Monday bank holiday if you're in Scotland. If not, enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel.